Once again, Sarah Rosen Mortel. So I got to visit four of the Knowledge Labs, and I hope uh, just that sampling that I got was pretty cool. And I hope that each of you got to enjoy what I hope is not the end, but the beginning of a conversation with us and many others around really what sounded like great discussions. Um, so my great pleasure now is to introduce another terrific change maker. Since its creation, the Arnold, uh, John and Laura Arnold Foundation, which is now known as Arnold Ventures, has had a steadfast commitment, unique in some ways amongst its foundation partners, to using evidence and the research that helps to create it to guide policy, to make sure that our society invests its public resources in things that work. As the reach of Arnold Ventures has grown to new areas, so is their impact improving programs, lives, and communities every day. Recently, the Arnolds have become even more focused, as I think uh, Kelly will tell us in a minute, on making sure that we target evidence to the point of decision, ensuring that facts and data are not just sitting on a shelf, but they are designed to support decision makers, stakeholders, and the communities themselves at the very moments when they are together making important choices. As we at Urban have pushed ourselves to, in recent years to make sure our work was more relevant and accessible, we've had no better partner than the Arnold Foundation, which has invested in us and, like another foundation I mentioned this morning, challenged us and pushed us to be better uh, and really demonstrated what it means to be change agents in philanthropy today. About two years ago, the foundation hired a dynamic new president to lead these efforts to great result. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you the president and CEO of Arnold Ventures, Kelly Ree. Thank you, Sarah. At Arnold Ventures, we see ourselves as problem solvers. Broken systems, collapsed markets, what seem like insurmountable problems, we aim to identify and fix them. Today, I want to talk to you about an institution that is failing and in desperate need of change, our nation's prison system. But before I tell you about the problems that we're facing, I want to start with a bright spot. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of visiting the DC jail and a very innovative program there called Young Many Werging, or YME. That program appears to be paying dividends. YME has an entirely different approach to restore hope to those who are serving time so these men can re-enter their communities with a brighter future. And with a caveat of saying that we haven't rigorously studied this program, I'd like for you to take a look at the video and see what it looks like to reimagine prisons. Dreaming, that's the only way dreams grow. I keep my head high. You can't win if you keep it low. We emerging, we emerging. Keep striving, going, keep growing. We believe in you. We believe in you. We believe in. This is the future of correction. We are changing the dynamics. I've been incarcerated for now 23 years. I'm a founding mentor on the Young Men Emerging Unit, a therapeutic environment, a rehabilitative space for the 18 to 25 demographic. When I came inside of YME, I still had the same attitude. I still was acting the same. A lot of people had belief in me that I did not see in myself. They brought Drayvon out of Drayvon. I was only taught to destroy the, the environment. Why me it has put the community in my life and, and showed me how to like build it up. And we love you for we lift it up. The uh, amount of love 
and support that I see there is something that I wish was throughout, not necessarily just the jail, but just in regular communities. Those closest to the problem is closest to the solution, but furthest from the resources and the power. What inspires me? You. And the thing that I struggle with is this. If you only see yourself as I see you inside. So the vision is to one, yes, to reform the prison space, to make it more humane, but more so to take these ideas and these concepts and take them into society. So we can stop people coming into prison yeah. in droves. Yeah. Love is an action word, and I'm willing to serve. Nevertheless, we am a test. I'm a man of my word. I'm a young man emerging. While the people I'm serving know that I'm rising for certain. My spirit is never hurting. Believe in me, believe in us, and trust gon' take us far. I'm like a diamond in the rut, turned to a shining star. Gave me life at 16. Never knew what that mean. Attempted to murder my dream. Gave me one under my wings. Why me realist? I say this pattern created to tame. I'm saluting the queen. It's inspiring. When I see what's happening at YME, I'm filled with hope. You might wonder why I started with a bright spot, and it's unfortunate as to why. We really don't have too many of them when it comes to America's prison systems. Unfortunately, we actually lack the data and evidence to really know what is happening behind prison walls. And what we do know is not good. I'd like to share with you a few of the, the sobering facts. The size of our prison system is absolutely staggering. The U.S. makes up about 5% of the world's population but we are home to 25% of the world's incarcerated people. If our prison system were a city, it would be the ninth largest in the US, just ahead of Dallas, Texas. The relative size of our prison system outpaces other countries, and we aren't safer for it. The growth in prison since the 1990s has produced almost no improvement in public safety. If, the watch, if you've watched the news, I'm sure you've seen stories about the brutal conditions and violence inside prisons. Most recently in Alabama, a Justice part, rep, Department report outlined cases of inmate deaths, sexual abuse, and entirely too grim conditions. So with that, it is not a surprise that those who spend time in prison come out worse off. Half wind up back behind bars within three years. That's a 50% failure rate of this government system. We wouldn't accept that kind of failure from virtually any other institution. What if half of students failed to graduate from our public schools? What if half of hospital patients were readmitted for the same condition they were treated for in the first place? What if the IRS just decided that collecting half of taxes was good enough for this year? We would say those government systems are broken, they need to be fixed, or we're defunding them. But here, we have a system that fails 50% of the time, and we're really not even studying the problem, much less waving a red flag. Until now. Incarceration is an inescapable part of our criminal justice system. And we have a responsibility to ensure that prisons are run effectively and humanely. In order to see this kind of radical change take place, it's going to start with giving data and evidence to decision makers. They need to know what to do and where to invest. And that is why I'm here today. Arnold Ventures is pleased to announce a $10 million grant to the Urban Institute. <laughs> Urban will create prison research, researcher partnerships in four states, where policymakers will work with those in the community to use data and evidence to guide innovations in prison design, 
operations, and culture. This work, I believe, will be the cornerstone of prison reform. It will be a cornerstone of our work in this space, and I believe it will be a cornerstone of Urban's next 50 years. As a start, we are also in supporting important work with other groups, including the Vera Institute of Justice, the Justice Policy Institute, Unchained Media Collective, One Voice, and the Ladies of Hope Ministries. I look forward to seeing the impact of this work. Success to me will be coming back here, I hope soon, to talk about the inroads that we've made, about the lives changed, and about a system that is better. So before I close, I have a special, special message. Um, those in this room are not the only audience I'm speaking to. I want to say hello to the YME group. So the gentlemen that you saw in the video are watching us via live stream. So everyone feel free to wave or applaud. And um, I have a message for you, YME, that only you will understand. Today, I'm a 10. And I'm a 10 because I'm filled with hope. In the video you at YME said, those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from the resources and the power. I want you to know we're listening and we want to work with you. Because you, YME, and you, the Urban Institute, are a part of the change our system desperately needs. Thank you. Please welcome Anna Mason, Mayor Michael Tubbs, Edward Schuyler, Ai-jen Poo, and Deval Patrick. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for the warm welcome. And uh, I'm excited to be here with these incredible change makers. Our task today, and please excuse my back, um, our task today is to address the question, where does change come from? And this morning, uh, in conversation, uh, uh, the first response to that was actually a response to a different question, which I heard is, why does change come? And it was from Ai-jen, who talked about uh, how movements come from the failure of other models. And I wondered if we could start there. Sure. Um, first of all, happy birthday <laughs> to the Urban Institute. Congratulations on entering midlife. <laughs> um, it's great to be here and such an honor to be on this stage with so many people I've admired for so long. Um, so I represent a workforce that works in our private homes um, as caregivers for our children, our aging parents and grandparents, our loved ones with disabilities. They clean. Um, it's work that has historically been um, associated with women and as a profession, women of color. And I would say that our economic model has really failed this workforce generation after generation. And what I was referring to earlier in our conversation was the fact that many existing models for social change have also failed this workforce. Um, and I was thinking specifically about collective bargaining in that, you know, even if it were legal, which it actually isn't protected under the National Labor Relations Act because of a historic exclusion that has its roots in anti-black racism um, in the New Deal. Um, but even if it were legal to collectively bargain, there's no collective and there's no one to bargain with. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the people you work with and for are people that you authentically, genuinely care about. Because if you didn't, you couldn't do your job. Right. And so there's a way in which fundamentally we had to completely reimagine how to achieve dignity and opportunity and mobility for this workforce. And so we kind of had the advantage of not having to deal with existing blueprints and reinvented our own. So we, we have three operating principles, one being 
that in a movement for human dignity, there's no such thing as an unlikely ally. The second being that the people closest to the pain or the problem need to inform the solutions. Mm. They have to power the solutions. This is the point that came through in, in the video, in the video so and that Kelly repeated, yes. And then the third being that there's no way that as organizers and domestic workers, we alone could see the range of tools at our disposal to achieve change. And that we needed to engage with entrepreneurs and technologists and engineers and storytellers and people who were shaping the world around us every day, but using a different set of tools. Mm -hmm. And so we've brought in um, entrepreneurs and built an innovation lab that just launched its very first product, which is a benefits platform for domestic workers. And that's my Aaliyah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Say a word about that. Yeah, so Aaliyah is, the, is a technology-based benefits platform that is portable, meaning it follows the worker, and it allows for multiple clients to contribute in a prorated basis to a benefits account that then the worker gets to decide what she wants to apply the benef what she wants to apply the money in her account towards and it could be paid time off accident insurance disability insurance life insurance critical injury insurance um, some of the more expensive products we don't have yet but we will if you help us get to scale and <laughs> sign up right now um, but so we have for the very first time we're able to offer benefits to domestic workers um, and it's just the beginning of what's possible, leveraging technology um, in partnership with technologists, engineers, entrepreneurs. Um, our colleague, Palak Shah, who leads our innovation lab, she always says Silicon Valley has done an amazing job solving for convenience and efficiency. It has to be able to help us solve for equity and dignity. And that's what we're trying to innovate with in our lab anchored in this movement of women who do this work every day so that in real time they can inform what products are we offering how are we creating the how are we designing so that it actually works in the context of their lives um, I want to I want to um, I want to bring Anna in you mentioned Silicon Valley <laughs> Anna has been working through rise of the rest on some of the ways in which venture capital Mm -hmm. is concentrated, over-concentrated on the mm -hmm. coasts. What model failed? Yep. I guess maybe, maybe that was the model. Yeah, and, and, and so much of that, Ajahn, res resonates with me because you know, I think the answer, you know, my answer to the question is uh, startups, change, startups change the future. And what's happened over the past couple of years as there has been this intense concentration of the capital that gets invested into startups, it's about $100 billion a year, and 50% of that goes to California, mostly Northern California. 75% goes to Northern California, New York City, and Boston is that startups have become synonymous with Silicon Valley, and, and in many ways, it's also been become synonymous just with technology and technological change and a lot of scary things that, that go along with that. Mm -hmm. And so our model um, with Rise of the Rest is really about this idea of an, an, a more equitable distribution of capital to a broader range of startups and entrepreneurs who are overlooked and underrepresented when it comes to where and how venture capital is getting invested. Because this question of what startups are solving for is mm -hmm. so critically important. Mm -hmm. And we have reached this moment in time where technology has become incredibly prevalent, some might say ubiquitous. And so that's actually created an opportunity for startups to reimagine and rebuild different industries that would not have been possible 15, 20, 30 years ago when it was about the, the technology risk and can you actually build this? Mm. So what's happening now, and um, you know, the, the point earlier about whether or not um, uh, you know, when, when the prison system is failing in such a way that if you were to look at some other industries and see those types of failure rates or lack of success rates, you would say, oh my goodness, but actually there are so many industries where that is true. Mm -hmm. Education is one great example. Half a trillion dollars a year um, is, is what's estimated that, public, that, that uh, the university systems across the country earn, but 75% of students today say that they don't feel that their education is preparing them for the future. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like in any other, you know, industry or business, that would be a pretty bad customer mm -hmm. success rate. Mm -hmm. So, 
what we see now is startups who are reimagining that future and trying to solve that broken system. And so that is an example of startups. Um, when it comes to prison reform, actually, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, there's a, there's a great company there. And it's actually a food, it's, it's actually a fast, a fast casual restaurant called Hot Chicken Takeover. Mm -hmm. Um, their innovation is not around technology, it's around their business model. They employ a fair chance hiring model, mm -hmm. and th because they actually, the majority of their employees are actually formerly incarcerated um, individuals, they built so many more safety nets and systems into how they support their employees that there's actually lower turnover. Yeah. And so it's become a, a really interesting innovation and advantage for them. In the, uh, in the worst of the recession in my old job, I remember Len Schlesinger calling this, this phrase, entrepreneurs of necessity, mm -hmm. meaning people who had been so disrupted by the downturn in the economy, they were having to figure it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were figuring it out you know, on their own with um, their neighbor, with a with a cousin, um, and that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit and style needed to be honored and supported uh, as well, not just the folks who were mm -hmm. creating um, you know, fancy um, uh, companies with yep. VC backing in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, I wanna ask about whether the role, there is role, a role still for government. Um, Mayor Tubbs, you're in government. Ed, you used to be as deputy mayor of, uh, of New York. Um, let me start with you, Mayor Tubbs. Is change happening outside of government now and not through government? How do you, is, it, is that too binary a way to look at it? Well, I'm just gonna try to have my cake and eat it too. Yeah. So I, I, would, I would say I'm both in. Mm -hmm. um, I do think so, given the current, well, not even current, I, I, I think it's ahistorical to act like political dysfunction is new. Mm -hmm. It just was created in 2016. That's just not the history of this country. And I think government is scale, which is why I'm so interested in why I spend so much. That's why I decided to do government as, um, at least for the short term as a career, because that's ultimate scale. But I also know that for, this, for scale to move, it takes some of the outside forces and pressures and people pushing, but also innovations and people saying, oh, we can do this better. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely think there's a role for government, because when you think of kind of public benefits and public goods, it's the folks I, I fight for everyone, but the folks I really fight for are those who are routine left out, mm -hmm. the marginalized folks like the people um, you fight for who actually don't have the money to opt out, mm -hmm. can't afford private schools or private security or, or all these other other things, and they really need government to work and, and work efficiently. So mm -hmm. because of that, I, I definitely, there's, there's a role for government, and at its best, um, government can do everything but they can at least set the ground rules, the regulations, lay the foundations upon which innovations can occur and, and upon which people can make the choices to live lives with dignity and to create more opportunities for themselves. Mm -hmm. So think about, think about, you've been in office now three years, four years? Three years as mayor, but four years before that city council. So I started at six. And think about, <laughs> <laughs> talk, about talk about an innovation or a change uh, a system change you've been working on, if you've been able to achieve that you're particularly proud of, that you think is a, a real breakaway achievement? Yeah, well, they're not quite yet at systems change level, but there's really two or three, not experiments, but two or three pilots we're running that I think have great potential. The first one um, that everyone talks about is that we're running a basic income demonstration um, in Stockton. Um, the idea being not that, it, regardless of automation and displacement, on um, that today, one in two Americans can afford one five hundred dollar emergency, or as you shared in the back room, seventy percent of Americans make less than fifty k a year. So people are working, but work does equal pay, and that work also does equal dignity. That people are working incredibly hard, but are stressed and anxious, and, and it's particularly in California, can't afford necessities mm -hmm. like rent, like um, electricity, utilities, etc. Um, so we're, we're, we're piloting a guaranteed income for folks who live in census tracts at or below the city's median of $500 um, a month. We started in February. And what's been fascinating isn't what I felt would happen just from personal experience. Uh, the majority of people are good actors. The majority of people are no different than me and you, meaning that if you give them money, they probably will make good decisions and the right decisions for their families. Not 100% of the time, but I don't know anything that works 100% of the time percent of the time anyway. So I'm not sure why that criterion is, is, is attached to this solution. Um, but, but also just the conversation and that we're, we're forcing 
not just locally, but at the state level with Governor Newsom extending the earned income tax credit and doubling it this year, um, but also national folks running for president talking about, hey, we need to fix the fundamentals of this economy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that is very promising in terms of system change and getting us to really recognize that that before we even talk about the future, we have to get the fundamentals right in present. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second innovation we're working on is around gun violence mm -hmm. um, reduction. So we have two models we're running in Stockton, ceasefire and advanced peace. And the models are very similar in that we understand using data that in a city of 320,000 people, it's less than 1% of our population that at any given time are likely to be victims and perpetrators of violent crime. And these folks aren't aliens, meaning they're not unknown to the system. On average, they've been on probation or parole um, they're on probation and parole. They've been arrested on average eight times. Their average age is 26 years old. 72% um, of them have a high, have, don't have a high school diploma or a GED. Hmm. And 35% of them are housing insecure. So like we know who these folks are. They're interacting with our systems. And now we're figuring out if, if in addition to law enforcement, which as we, in jails, which we have seen are a part, but can't be the whole solution. Mm -hmm. But what if we extend the opportunity in very extensive, intensive case management, um, jobs, workforce development training, but, but also just a, everyday case management, what does that do to in terms of change? And what we saw last year was a 40% um, reduction in mm -hmm. homicides and a 30% reduction in shootings, but we're rigorously evaluating and seeing sort of what is the secret sauce, so it becomes institutionalized in a system and just how we do public safety um, in Stockton. Mm -hmm. Ed, you, um, you're at City now, we're going to come to that, and the role of business um, as a uh, uh, as a change maker and a catalyst for, for change, but just on this question of government having a role, um, think back to your time as uh, as deputy mayor in New York with with Mayor Bloomberg, right? Yep. Yeah. What um, and you know I, he was very interested in in innovators, yep. um, and you had other he had other uh, deputy mayors in to focus on that. What was your focus, and and what are innovations and changes that you particularly Proud of. Yeah, well, just in, in thinking about the Silicon Valley um, conversation, I think it's an interesting case study for the power of cities and what mayors can do, because essentially why you have this concentration of venture capital in California is because the rest of the country conceded engineering, applied science, education to the West Coast, and specifically to the Valley in Stanford, and that community grew out of there. And what you saw when you know, Mayor Bloomberg, Lord Cornell, um, created applied sciences, uh, institution in New York City, and you see with Carnegie Mellon in, in, in Pittsburgh, you see where the investment comes and where you have support, local support, to create these communities, then you actually can see whether you want to call it the Silicon Valleys or the alleys of the world pop up mm -hmm. when you actually see the, uh, the public sector um, uh, impetus at a local level. It's not going to be the federal government. They're not going to redistribute you know, where venture capital money goes, but you can go to the source and get the talent there and then it can, it can be incubated um, that way. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, I agree with the mayor, political, political dysfunction isn't new, but the lack of confidence um, by citizens that government will solve any problem <laughs> is probably at an unprecedented and unacceptably you know, high levels. I mean, you think about some of the things we did in the, in the, the Bloomberg administration, the, uh, the ban on, um, on smoking in public places, which we, by the way, stole from you know, Aspen. It wasn't like we came up with it. Mm -hmm. But um, now you have, two, I think, 2,000 American cities that have some type of public smoking restrictions, probably increased life expectancy you know, by several years on average. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything the federal government has done in that period of time to improve public health on, on that scale? Um, certainly, they're not doing it with gun violence. So I do think that local governments by what they do individually and how they take from each other, um, not just nationally but internationally. I mean, bike sharing is another great example. It was sort of, you know, poo-pooed as this European thing. Oh, it's from Amsterdam or Paris. <laughs> you know, New York City, that when, we, uh, when we started it, we had 10 million trips the first year. We've had 75 million trips um, since it started in 2012. Mm -hmm. So I think what you can see is, you know, cities can drive change, and cities aren't afraid of stealing from each other, and it's that network of, uh, of the cities as urban laboratories that can benefit in um, uh, people's experiences and people's lives in a way that is just sort of too divorced and abstract for you know um, the people that unfortunately we send to work you know in this city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, <laughs> it's it. Yeah, you got except for Sean Donovan, who did a great job. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> 
I'm not, I'm not talking about appointed reaction. officials. I'm you talking know, about I, 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 would, I would say that uh, we didn't arrive at a, uh, at a view, if it is a consensus view, that the federal government um, was dysfunctional by accident. That was a rhetorical point for mm -hmm. a long time um, that, um, in my own view, was as um, silly as, uh, as saying, you know, we have a bad congressman and so forth, democracy, let's get rid of it. You know, we have problems, they need to be solved, we should address them. The question of the role of which level of government is a, pre uh, is a perennial question in this, uh, uh, in this country, and we made a cartoon of it, in my own view, um, over, uh, instead of taking it as seriously as I think uh, the founders intended us to take it. But let me turn to business as a change maker. Um, you're at City now. Um, City, um, well, speak in particular, I'm, I'm one, I'm, I'm, I particularly want to get, and I warned you, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the firearms uh, initiative. Um, but start there and then tell us what you see when you look out at uh, the business community as a source of, uh, of change, particularly around these issues of economic mobility, racial e equity, and inclusive growth, which is the focus of the year. Sure. The firearms policy, I think, for us, I think after Parkland, I mean, we felt it, and maybe others felt it. Um, it felt like there was this sort of hopelessness that no matter how horrific the incident was, nothing was going to change. Mm -hmm. And in a way, the, I think you know, we, we saw the pressure shift to businesses and to the corporate sector to actually try to come up, maybe not with solutions, but at least try to do something. Mm -hmm. And we felt that, but we also felt something that we didn't anticipate, which was internally. We had um, our own people asking us, you know, what are we doing about this? What are, what's our policy in firearms? Mm -hmm. We had um, several families involved, uh, impacted by Parkland. Yes. Um, and when we you visited them and expressed our condolences, it was like, we appreciate that. And what is our company doing about it? Hmm. And we didn't have an answer. Were you surprised by the question? You know, I shouldn't have been surprised by it because I look at all the data that shows that four out of five people expect companies to lead and that, uh, that companies are you know, more trusted than government as far as um, their ability to actually change things. So all the number is there, but then the thing happens and, and you're actually feeling it. Yeah. And I frankly had you know, it was an issue I didn't want to take on because I, um, from my you know, jobs in City Hall, I had my own, you know, views that I brought to the table. Yeah. So I, you know, not volunteered ever to get involved in it. But at this point, you know, um, our core responsibility, um, our environmental, social risk management, all these things are things that are, you know, part of my portfolio. Yeah. And the CEO says, well, we don't, if we don't have a policy and then make recommendations, at that point you don't have a choice. Mm. And so what we try to do is just draw on the best practices that are out there mm -hmm. and ask our commercial clients that sell firearms, retail sector clients, to employ the basic best practices. No check, no sale. So background checks have prevented three million banned purchasers from buying firearms mm. since they were enacted. Mm -hmm. um, however, because you can sell a firearm after three days if you don't get an answer, from the background check system, you do have people that, because the background check is not completed, are able to purchase a firearm, it happens 3,500 times a year. Yep. Somebody, if the real t retailer had waited. Yep. So no check, no sale says, if you don't get cleared, you can't sell the firearm. I may be wrong, but I think that's Dylan Roof's story from the shooting in Charleston. Mm -hmm. um, he was in the, he was yep. beyond the wait period. It's depending on the jurisdiction, after three days, you're, from federal perspective, allowed to sell the firearm. Mm -hmm. Another one is over 21 age restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, four times the amount of, uh, of those that enact gun violence, inflict gun violence, um, are between 18 and 20 versus over 21 years old. So mm -hmm. it's another common sense restriction to make sure you're not selling to people in that age demographic unless they have specific military training, police training, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then bump stocks and, and, um, and uh, high capacity magazines. These are just meant to increase the, leth the, the lethalness of, of firearms. And, and by the way, all the three things that I mentioned have between 70 
and 95% support from the American people. Mm -hmm. So these aren't like fringe <laughs> ideas. These are established best practices. And, we, and what, by the way, most of our clients follow them. Mm -hmm. And which is why when people said, well, you must, what was the business impact of this policy? Insignificant. Mm -hmm. Because our, you know, the people we do business with, for the most part, not exclusively, but to the most part, employ these types of best, best mm -hmm. practices. So you know, for us, it wasn't an easy decision, but we, had to, we felt we, we should have an answer internally and externally mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, as far as who we chose to take on as a client, not from a consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. You have a city credit card and you want to buy a gun, you know, it goes, you know, we, uh, we assume the merchant will, will follow the correct law, but as far as our clients, um, we felt that we needed to, to have a policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you draw the line between where city, or take a hypothetical business, how should a business think about where it should have a policy point of view and, and, uh, and, and try to make change rather than not? I think what we do ask ourselves, and it's all highly subjective, is, is there a business impact? So take an example like tax reform, yep. clearly a business impact. Then you can look at other public policies, for example, most of um, health care reform, while we do have some health, um, some clients in the sector, it's not a direct impact on us. It might be from a personnel perspective, mm -hmm. but it doesn't in impact the business model. So we do look at it and try to rate it that way. Mm -hmm. We also look at it in terms of social impact. Is it a, is it a hot button issue? Mm -hmm. um, and we try to think about it in the, in the, in the eyes of our investors, institutional investors, our, our consumer clients, um, and our stakeholders, which could be anywhere from you know, regulators, so even our board of directors, and as I mentioned, our employees, which yep. expect, and, and it becomes a distinguishing characteristic when we're recruiting on campus. We're being asked these questions. Yes. Do you finance prisons? We don't. Yes. And by the way, we didn't need somebody to tweet at us you know, to get us to change our policy. We just weren't in that business. Yes. Um, so we, you know, these are things that people you know, the people that you want to hire want to know what you stand for. Yes. And so it's becoming, uh, it's just almost a, a, a necessary, um, it's necessary to have these policies and have these points of view yeah. increasingly. I want to pull on that thread with, with uh, others and, 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 and really ask, is power shifting? In a, in a way, the, the recruiting uh, anecdote that, that uh, Ed described is something I've experienced. Um, it's marvelous. It feels like um, it feels like those new hires understand they have power. Um, they have something they can use to influence how uh, the choices that we make. You're organizing what had been thought of, I think, in many quarters as a very vulnerable, um, highly dispersed uh, workforce, and and recognizing that in that collective non-collective, there's power. Mm -hmm. Um, the, you know, Anna, the way you talk about trying to move the, and call attention to the talent and creativity uh, and startup uh, disposition beyond the, uh, in places beyond the, uh, the respective coasts, east and west uh, uh, coast. It's also about power moving, because there's, there's power associated with those venture capital dollars. We've talked about local government. Is, is power shifting in, in, in some way? Is there a pattern here anywhere? Everybody's scared of this question. <laughs> no. all these powerful people are here. Right? <laughs> um, I would say a few things that um, power is definitely shifting. And, um, and I think about power in lots of different dimensions. Um, there's power, there's traditional political power um, right, the ability to move voters and win elections and win policy change. I think about it in terms of um, economic power, the ability to shape markets and direct capital, and then also what I call narrative power yes. or cultural power, the ability to tell the story of why things are the way that they are on your terms, um, and essentially to be able to define reality. And I think that more and more people are engaged with trying to build power mm. along those different, 
dimensions and more of those ways of building power are interacting with each other. Mm. Um, and I think it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about the ways that artists are becoming more civically engaged or the ways that there's just this incredible upsurge in civic participation with mm. so many people and women in particular voting in the midterms unprecedented in numbers. Mm -hmm. We have this ability in this moment, right here, right now, to transform the logic of power mm. in this era. Mm -hmm. And that feels incredibly exciting and also so necessary mm -hmm. to me. Mr. Mayor, is, is power shifting? Well, well, I think what's interesting is that I think while power is shifting, um, partly because demographics are shifting, and attitudes are, are shifting, but you see traditional folks who hold power um, reacting in, in very extreme ways, I, I would argue. So, so I think in the conversation about power shifting, it's in, it's in a context where the forces of what some would define as regression are becoming even that much more emboldened as a direct reaction to power shifting. For example, I think we all read the news of what's happening in Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, today, mm -hmm. um, as a direct response to I, I, last week, you just announced a big women's political movement where eighty thousand women signed up, and a week later, we have right. these draconian attacks on, on, on women's health care. And I think, um, from political power being used to further concentrate economic power mm -hmm. um, to the top through two trillion dollars in tax cuts, or um, political power being used to stem the f flow of immigration from people who look. A certain, fit a certain demographic and look a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I, I think we see power reacting to, to power shift, which, which kind of demands um, the, 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 the strategy you mentioned in terms of not just doing political power or not just economic power and not just narrative power, but really marrying those threes mm -hmm. to not d d define a new reality that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. And it also tells a true story about not just where we've been or not just about how dark it is where we are now, but kind of the agency and the power we have to create where we need to go mm -hmm. um, in, in a way where power is not concentrated but more diffuse. Mm -hmm. um, and that folks, because in, in the simplest definition, power is the ability to act. Mm -hmm. So kind of really using those three forms of power as defined to, to, to give people um, true choices and, and true agency mm -hmm. um, to, to be powerful at, at the micro level. But, but I say all that to say that I think that particularly in this moment we have to be cognizant that 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 with with power shifting there's there, there's an equally powerful reaction for those who have a lot of power that will dilute the impact of the power shift to create the world we want when mm -hmm. we just have to acknowledge that and 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 become I think even more emboldened and even more um, vocal and, and clear about sort of how we want power to be used, not to oppress, not to take away, not to extract, but to give. Mm. Um. And, Anna? Yeah, I would add, um, I think my pregnant pause when you first asked the question was because in my head I was thinking, well, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and as I reflected more on, on that baseline, you know, I think where I really land on this is the, the question, is power shifting, suggests that it's a fixed pie. Yes. And if some have it, others don't. And I think I would posit that, it, at least um, from our worldview in the venture space, power is expanding yes. and the pie is expanding. And that is very much so, I think, central to um, the efforts that a lot of startups and a lot of different industries have. It's, it's not can you make these small incremental changes, but can you Re can you reimagine an industry that might not exist yet? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the baseline statistic that I, that or data point that I referenced in, you know, in the opening that 75% of venture capital is really concentrated. You know, we've been banging the drum on this for a long time. Turns out that the numbers actually aren't moving um, in, in absolute terms all that much. It was, you know, 78% three years ago. It was 75% last year. We were like all high-fiving. This year it went back up a little, you uh -huh. know, a little edged back up closer in, in the high 70s. But the absolute number shifted. So it was, you know, $80 billion invested in 2017 and north of $100 billion in 2018. So that means even though there was still very concentrated investment and by extension power and all that and opportunity and all that comes with it in those concentrated places, yes. 
you were starting to see major exits and you know the unicorns, the north of a billion dollar valuations in, in cities all across the country. You had exact target in Indianapolis exit for you know just under three billion dollars a couple of years ago. You had Duo Security in Ann Arbor exit for uh, just around $2 billion. Shipped in Birmingham, Alabama, sell to Target for just about half a billion dollars. And that creates, it's not just the, the, the money and the wealth that it creates, but it's the opportunity, the connections, the mentorship, the mm -hmm. knowledge and the know-how. And, and that starts to create these really interesting innovation ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So I am the, I'm the optimist that looks at um, the pie expanding, even though there will be, I think, a natural um, pendulum swing in terms of which actors are actually holding that power. Yeah, yeah. you know, on this uh, on this point about more people having power or recognizing that they can, um, I, I remember w as governor, I thought my my greatest power was the convening power, mm -hmm. meaning that almost everybody would accept an invitation from the governor to come. And, uh, and sit down with me. And so you could bring to the table people who normally didn't sit down with each other mm -hmm. and get them to recognize in time, not right away, <laughs> their, uh, the power of that collaboration, that they could come together and solve issues. I, I always thought that, that uh, healthcare um, uh, expansion for us was successful in Massachusetts in ways it was harder nationally because the there was this broad coalition that came together to invent it, and then they stuck together to refine it. Mm. And we did, you know, mm. bill after bill after bill because we were learning. Mm. There is a, there's, a, there's a convening power business has as well, especially a business like, like City. Do you see this, Ed? Do you, do you use it? Yeah. Uh, or do other businesses use it? Uh, you know, we I don't, don't mean to pick on City. No, I mean, um, I, I guess we don't really think about it in terms of power, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it, you know, work, I try to think of terms of power at home when I'm trying to get a you know, five-year-old, two-year-old to go to sleep and I realize I have none. Yes, <laughs> right. You know, at work we think about our ability to influence. Yes. Um, and, and how do we bring people together and how do we collectively um, bring our resources to the table and push each other. If you take a look at climate change, you start with the equator principles, you know, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now you see banks competing to who can do uh, the most, um, uh, the largest amount of uh, sustainable finance commitments. And right now we're at 100 billion over 10 years. We're going to finish it in six years. And others have larger goals. And that's, you get this sort of healthy competition, mm -hmm. but also um, companies coming together when the U.S. decides to step out of the Paris Accords and companies partnering with localities as well and, and, uh, and NGOs, you know, um, becoming founding partners that we're still in and saying, okay, government can go one way, we can go another. Mm -hmm. So I think that they're, they're collectively we do, um, we try to f focus on how we can influence things. Mm -hmm. And through our own policies, we're not trying to be top down about it. We're trying to do things that are true to our values. Mm -hmm. And if people find those instructive and want to be challenged by them or follow them or iterate on them, then great. Mm -hmm. But we're not trying to, we focus on trying to change ourselves um, as, opposed to, as opposed to change others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the role of facts, you mentioned climate change, so I have to. <laughs> um, how, do you how do you engage, um, you know, I, I, I remember reading once that um, sometimes uh, people can look at the same facts and reach different conclusions, and that is culture. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens if people look at the same picture, the same reality, and they, it's not just different conclusions, they see a completely different picture. They see different, mm -hmm. different facts. What are, the, what are the role of, what's the role of facts? What's the knowledge you mm -hmm. need in order to move the change you're trying to move? Hi, Jen. I have a feeling there's a fact bias in this room. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to like roll this with that. This is the one question um, that Sarah made me ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's what I would say is I would say I've thought a lot about this because um, you know I've been doing advocacy for 25 years now. And 
I've seen the role of facts and where it's effective and how it's effective and where it's limited. And where I think it's limited is that there's what's factually true and then there's what's emotionally true for people. And they're two different things. And, um, and they're both shaping our reality mm. and our behaviors, mm. our choices, consciously and unconsciously. And so we have to be really smart about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to have the facts and the data and the evidence and the arguments and all of that. And we also have to be really in touch with the human dimension that is not always rational, in fact, oftentimes not. The emotional lives of human beings as they go through the experience of life and how that is shaping mm -hmm. choices and behaviors and practices. And, and until we get really serious about that dimension mm -hmm. of the world mm -hmm. <laughs> and how we're engaging with it. And that dimension of decision making. And that dimension of decision making. Mm -hmm we're going to be very constrained mm -hmm. in our impact. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Mr. Mayor, you, 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 deal <laughs> with, that smile. You, <laughs> you deal with this, I have to believe, all the time. I mean, the, 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 there is, a, there is a, uh, an undeniable reality about the, about the fact that more people may be working, um, but they are unable to feed themselves or feed their families. You know, uh, uh, unemployment is down, but uses of food pantries is skyrocketing uh, at the same time. And along you come uh, with uh, a, a minimum guaranteed income. Um, how do you deal with, uh, with the fact that folks point to data that say everybody's, everybody's working, inflation's down, yeah. you know, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, I think, and, and, and to, to the point raised, and I didn't realize this at first, um, but I'm learning more and more, and I think there's like neurological research that talks about this, how when facts don't confirm our bias, we're more likely to double down our biases than to like go to facts, right? And I just discovered that like 20,000 times in my first month, and I was like, mm. wait, wait, wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then, but then I realized that if there was a way to humanize or tell stories or give anecdotes or to use or to use one's experience and kind of marry that to fact, because I think and I don't know I'm not a neurologist, but I think that when a fact doesn't confirm my experience, then maybe I think I'm faced with a choice as to whether I've been I'm, I've been living a lie or this is not true, and it's easier to believe that this thing isn't true and the, my experience, my one interaction, my one time this happened is more true than whatever had been RTC tested. Um, so, so particularly with the basic income pilot, what we did in design was number one, understand that there's a, there's a deep bias around othering and, and people of color um, in this country. So making sure that from design that there was white people included in, 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 said, in said pilot. Um, number two, <laughs> Um, the, the thing we, we also just made sure we found people or randomly selected, but people who fit all types of different kind of narratives. So there's students, there's caregivers, yep. there's working people, there's people who make over 70K, there's people who make less than 20K, there's people who are on public benefits, there's people who aren't on benefits at all. And what I found even just in the last 18 months in talking about it in the city, because um, Stockton's super, it's like 40% Republican, 60% Democrat. My council's half Republican, half Democrat. So, so there's a lot of ideological diversity. But I found in talking about the stories of our neighbors and, and people, that people are more apt to listen to that and give it a chance than, than, than any facts. And I think we know, we, we know that to be true. Because mm -hmm. if facts were enough, then a lot of things we see happening just would not be, like, just, mm -hmm. just, just wouldn't be happening. So, so I think a lot of it is narrative work and, and, and humanizing. Um, and, and, and also understanding that, that while there's facts, there's also billions of dollars made in advertisements and presenting, I hate the term alternative facts, but, but presenting all different, different facts or, or, or downplaying the importance and salience of, of, of such facts. So I think being right is one thing, but I think the harder work is convincing people, like 
the, what it means to be right and why that's not a bad thing for you. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of that has to do with narrative. Mm -hmm. Anna, does this apply in your work? Is it there, does. Is, are, are markets <laughs> it <does>. rational? <laughs> um, I think, you know, in, in thinking about this idea of, of bias and facts and how the two interact, there, I think there are two threads to pull on when it comes to the venture space. Um, and as, as we think about how we have both self-awareness and perspective. And so I'll talk about self-awareness actually vis-a-vis -vis the, the gender gap in, in venture and then, and then talk about perspective when it comes to place, which is obviously at the, at the heart of our thesis. Um, so when it comes to gender, there's actually some, um, some really important research that's come out of Columbia Business School in the past couple of years around how um, venture capitalists, investors, actually both men and women, will ask, they'll be presented with the same company, the same basic information, the same facts, hmm. and one presentation is uh, by a male CEO and the other is by a female CEO. And the questions that the venture capitalists, again, both men and women, um, on the investor side of the table ask are vastly different. Mm. And so the questions asked of the male CEO are always you know, along the lines of how big can this be? Mm -hmm. um, and the questions that are typically asked of the female CEO is, you ever done well, what's your, what, what's your background and what, what happens if this goes wrong? Yeah. Mm. Um, and that starts to cr create and, and perpetuate a really, really vicious cycle about you know, not only the, the perception and the investing reality, so only 10% of venture capital goes to, goes to women um, and 1% to African Americans, so it's, it's, it's impacted on racial lines too. Um, but it, it also impacts how um, the founders on that side of the table start to respond and how they, they become more defensive. So it creates a really negative dance mm. that you need self-awareness. So there, there aren't that many women on the investing side of the table either, but it's something that, you know, on a personal level, I find myself constantly checking my own biases mm -hmm. when, you know, when I'm sitting in, uh, sitting in on, on meetings and pitches. Mm -hmm. When it comes to pers uh, the question of perspective and how important I think it is to have perspective about facts, so I think the same way that we have biases about people, we have biases about place. Um, yeah. And where and how we get our facts is so critically important. So the greatest irony of our uber-connected digital age is that we're less connected in person. Yes. We, we, you know, don't, you know, pick up the phone when we can text, and we don't text when we can email, and or we Snapchat, or whatever it is that we do. We have less human connectivity, mm. and so this idea of um, venture, you know, taking it back to venture capital, it, the concentration of venture capital into a few small places is because you know the country is vast, and it's not necessarily convenient or easy to get to all these different places. And so um, making the effort to seek out facts in person rather than relying on um, various, I think, digital mediums and communications is incredibly important. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, uh, that very simple idea of meeting people where they are, mm -hmm. and how important that is, I think mm -hmm. is very much so at the center of um, how we think about the world when it comes to rise of this the rest. Is, I think of what Brian Stevenson describes as the importance of being proximate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, this question of, of why change, sort of back to the, you know, because other models have failed. Mm. Do you think there is consensus in the, and this is, this is probably the most unfair of the unfair questions I've asked you. I've asked each of you have been asked to represent whole sectors of uh, of our society. But is there consensus? Um, would you say, from your perspective, perspectives, that we have a problem to solve, that economic mobility is a problem worth solving, that racial equity is a problem uh, worth solving, that that inclusive growth is a problem? Um, Ed, is it, um, do you mind? Well, I, um, I think we have lots of consensus depending on who we're talking to. And then there could be a lot of consensus and then we'll talk to um, people that are part of the same country and who see it very differently. Mm -hmm. And who see the opposite side of the same problem. Mm -hmm. And they see every solution as, as something that, you know, has perhaps left them out or discriminated against them. And I think we've, um, when you think about, tech, you think about what you're saying about technology, 
this perverse thing that has happened, in my opinion, over the last couple of years, is that our, our technology has allowed our country almost to interact with each other in a way they never had before. Um, because they're seeing somebody's opinion on Facebook or Twitter and they're going at each other. And these are people that would never meet. They just live <laughs> in different places, different parts of the country, almost different cultures. People have described them as almost you know, different nations in the same country. They would never meet before, but here they are colliding. And it's becoming more and more unpleasant, more and more disruptive, um, more and more uncivil, and harder to get consensus for solutions. Because we're finding out that we're just, we're, you know, not arguing at the dinner table here in a good natured way. We're just feeling like we are on, on you know, looking at the world fundamentally differently. It's a, it's a knife fight. What do you make of Anna's point, though, that um, we, I'm, I'm going to reduce it, but um, uh, that it's as sharp and as nasty because we never meet? Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's really easy to say, you know, to tweet something really obnoxious. You know, it's a lot harder to like sit down with the person and, yeah. and react that way. It's like this sort of buffer of technology that you can be totally disrespectful, totally uncivil to somebody um, beyond the really uh, horrific cyberbullying that you see, you know, with young children. Just mm. these are adults that are, are treating each other in a way that, you know, most likely if you ran into them on the street, you would never interact that way. But when mm -hmm. they start talking about these issues uh, with each other, um, through technology, it's just you can't you can't believe it. Mm. Anna, is the is is rise of the rest and the interest in in moving um, venture capital attention to uh, other centers of uh, of uh, of talent and creativity? Is that an equity issue or an economic issue or some combination of the two? I, I think it's very much so some combination of the two. Mm -hmm. um, but when we think about the, the the future and what the future of the country looks like, um, and and that means many different things. A lot of it, I think, for us comes down to um, you know the, one of the baseline facts that we return to, which is that you know most net new job creation in the country comes from small businesses and startups. So if the, if three quarters of the venture capital that's fueling these high growth businesses of the future is really concentrated while 85% of the Fortune 500 today is actually distributed all across the country, then there's um, both an economic and ultimately what will be an equity mismatch, mm -hmm. equitable mismatch, I think, down the line. So that that's a huge driving force, mm -hmm. I think, for us as, as we think about why this is so incredibly pressing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor? How do you how do you think about whether there's a consensus um, from your perch about whether we have um, economic and racial equity challenges that are that are actually a problem and that deserving of a solution? I definitely think there's consensus, um, particularly around economic issues. Those are concentrated in certain communities, but broadly and widely felt by the majority of Americans. I think part of the issue towards gain towards solutions are that number one, um, those who, it's like the opposite of what we saw in the video, those who have the power to implement said solutions aren't close to the problem, they're actually benefiting um, from the current arrangements or their stock portfolios are benefiting um, from, from the current arrangement, number one. Um, and then I think number two, there's a dispute about whether the causes are individual in nature, like me not liking you, or structural in nature, that there's institutions that have been designed that we shouldn't be surprised with the outcomes um, they're creating. And, and I think part of that tension between whether it's individual or, or structural um, leads to very different policy responses that, that, that may not get sort of to some of the root causes of, of, of what the problems are. Mm -hmm. But I would say in Stockton, I, I've really enjoyed just because of our diversity. Um, not even just ideological, but just ethnically, racially, et cetera, that we are forced to sit in rooms and have conversations and be proximate with, with people and with folks who ordinarily we probably wouldn't have contact with at church or mm -hmm. in Little League or, or in our social circles. But those are the groups, to your points about convening, that we have to convene to, to get to um, um, some of these solutions. And 
it's funny because I, I, I haven't been around here that long, but I, I but in, in my short reading of history, I also would argue these problems aren't new. Mm -hmm. Um, that you're talking like economic exclusion and racial equity and and economic mobility that th th those aren't those are been questions fundamentals from democracy from like land theft and, and genocide in the beginning and I think because of that the, the, the conversation just can't be about solutions but it has to be about like reconciliation and about kind of values if we are who we say we are on paper if we hold these truths to be self-evident then how do, we, how do we get closer to that goal? And I think part of the reason why we haven't seen as being solutions is that we start strictly from problem solution, but I think it's really deeper in, in terms of why values history, like how do we arrive to this point? Mm -hmm. And then how do we make sure the, whatever solutions we create, create together are not aligned with our ideologi ideologies, but are really aligned with our, these values we say we all commonly share, whether we're Democrat, independent, or Republican, which is easier said than done, but I think that difficult, hard, painful um, work of actually reckoning with, with our reality, which is just a reflection of a, of a history that's been ongoing with, with, with some iterations and some successes, but still structurally not pretty much unchanged. Mm -hmm. um, and grappling with that in that way and saying sort of from a values perspective, mm -hmm. in terms of what we value as a country, how do we get to these outcomes? I think we're, we're more likely to see positive solutions. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ajin? I think I would say something similar to what uh, Mayor just said in a different way. Um, I think about my friend Heather McGee, who used to run Demos, a think tank on democracy. She talks about the United States as the most ambitious experiment in democracy in the world. Because we have, if you think about it, there were the Native American First Nations, migrants from Europe, people who were brought here as part of the transatlantic slave trade, generation upon generation of migrants from every country, every religion, every culture, every everything in the world, and then you tell us we're one. And that is not just the greatest experiment in democracy, but it's also the greatest organizing challenge in the history of the world. And I'm an organizer, so I think about things in that way, sorry. Um, and so it's a massive organizing challenge. And, and fortunately, I'm going to end us on an optimistic note, fortunately we are in the midst of an incredible organizing renaissance. And there's so many people, including everyone on this stage, is sounding like an organizer to me. It's just my screen maybe, but... Um, Literally, everyone is organizing in their own ways around what I see as truly majoritarian values in this country, mm. which are about equity, dignity, the ability to provide for your children, the ability for one generation to do better than the next, the ability to dream, to be healthy, to be safe. These are majoritarian values, and they can unite us, but it is a major organizing challenge Fortunately, we are in a great organizing renaissance, so it's all going to be okay. <laughs> that is brilliant. I, I think uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm so excited about um, leaving it there. Uh, <laughs> you can are, thank me later. We <laughs> are, uh, it, is, it is true. This is, our, this is a... Uh, this is an, a unique nation in the sense that we're not organized like any other nation <laughs> is organized. It wasn't geography or religion or language we organized around. It was a handful of civic ideals. Mm -hmm. And we've defined those ideals over time and through struggle uh, as equality, freedom, opportunity, yeah. fair play, and organizing around them has ebbed and flowed over time, but it's that notion that has made us a magnet for all those people from all those places right. from all over the world. That's exactly right. And uh, if every um, election, if an election is an, a reflection of our, uh, of our choices around values, every organizing uh, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the economic or social level, is uh, involves something about the character of the candidate or the leader. Right now, 
It's about the character of the country. That's right. Right now. Uh, and I agree with you. There is something really exciting about so many people from so many different perspectives coming off the sidelines and deciding to be a part of resolving that question. And we will all need, we will all need the best of the Urban Institute to do that right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for having me. And now, Urban Institute Board of Trustees Chair, Jamie Gorelick. So I, am, I have the uh, wonderful task of trying to wrap up in 10 minutes everything that has been said today. And uh, I was going to have, uh, as my partner in this, Mitch Daniels, the former governor of Indiana, the president of Purdue, uh, but his mentor in life, Senator Dick Luger, died, and the funeral is today. And so uh, Mitch will not get here until our board meeting tomorrow. Um, but uh, we have a fabulous uh, substitute uh, and volunteer, Rip Rapson, the uh, president of Kresge. Come on up, Rip, uh, to help us try to sum up um, what, what, we have, what we have heard, and to be a little provocative, which of course he knows nothing about. <laughs> um, Rip has uh, devoted uh, much of his career to helping uh, spur innovation in, order, in, the, in, in service of mobility, equality, justice, the kinds of things we heard about in this very last panel, which was yeah. fabulous, really fabulous. Thank you, Duvall, for, for uh, summoning up this group, and thank you to this group for inspiring us. Um, so let me, um, we only have uh, uh, 10 minutes. Let me just uh, say my part. I, um, as the chair of this uh, institute, I've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, 1968 when we began. It was my uh, senior year in high school. Uh, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were shot. Our cities were on fire, literally and figuratively, and uh, a war was raging and an internal war for the soul of our country was raging. And if you think back to that moment in time and then you think about our look forward, for the next 50, you want to have as much impact as we have had for the past 50 and more so. And you want to grapple with the most serious problems that we have. And we have had a feast today of problems <laughs> <laughs> and solutions. And, and that is what I, uh, I would hope that uh, Rip can have, help us sum up today. So first, Rip, if you can talk to us a little bit about what you heard that ac across these various subjects that might be common themes that we could take away. Yeah. Ready, smile. set, go. I, 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 <laughs> I, I smile just because of sort of the, the mind-numbing breadth of what we have heard today is just sort of the wonder and joy of Sarah, and, um, <laughs> but it is, it is daunting. Um, let me just, a couple of preliminary thoughts. One, it just seems to me that the conversations have powerfully affirmed the articulation of the values and the aperture of possibilities that Sarah and Brandy described first. So I think as we reflect back on the day, I, I hope we'll all go back to those framing remarks because they were, I think they were just quite extraordinary. Second, I don't think I have I can't remember when I've last um, heard the apocalypse described so powerfully as our tech panel. That was, um, that was, uh, that was quite something. Um, 
I, I told Vivian that I would not speak in a room in which she was present, so she's on a, an airplane. Um, but three, uh, maybe three very quick observations, because I think you almost have to rise to a meta level, given the complexity of what we've just heard. I think first is it seemed clear in the conversations I participated in that change is going to be driven at the city level by a very different distribution of power, authority, responsibility, and roles among the different sectors. That, that it won't be true in all places, but I think it will be true in more and more places. That essentially we have to rethink and reposition the public, the private, the nonprofit, the civic, and the philanthropic sectors in a way that almost resembles sort of reverse engineering, where you essentially certify a set of questions and challenges that community faces, and then reverse engineer to figure out who has the right tools and the right doses and the right sequences at the right pace to sort of move together uh, as a community. We heard that, I think, very powerfully in our, in our breakout section. Uh, second, that as we think about what I think is the inevitable deconstruction and sort of reconstruction of the structural impediments to full opportunity, it's got to be driven on a really powerful data platform. I think Sarah really laid that out powerfully. And that data platform, I think, in turn, has to be guided by racial equity. Uh, and I think that's, that's a big shift in, in the way we think about the role of data and analytics and, and learning. And I think, I think that came through loud and clear. And I think third, and I think the, the panel we just heard was really an extraordinary affirmation of this, that the, the, affir the um, aspirations, the energies, the wisdom of this next generation of young people equipped with new technologies and equipped with kind of the sophistication of movement building that we've seen so much in evidence in these last number of years will transform how change is arrived at, uh, how it takes root and how it transforms society's networks of change. And I think having iGen sort of leave us on that note was a really powerful reminder that that is true. And it will, it will fundamentally transform how we think about sort of networked change in a very complicated modern society. So those are very uh, powerful observations. Uh, and then it leads me to my second question, which I have one little answer to myself, <laughs> which is what should Urban be doing? Um, I thought the mayor's yeah. comment about if facts really mattered and that was all you needed, we would have a very different society mm -hmm. than we have. Um, and uh, I am looking forward to a continuation of the transformation that we've asked Sarah to uh, take us on, which she has boldly done, uh, where we take the facts that we know mm and we add a narrative. We communicate to people so that the broader populace embraces change that we know is necessary and achievable. And um, I think the symbolism of being in this building, mm. which is as light as the old place was dark, <laughs> uh, which is as vibrant as the old place was soporific, <laughs> it's amazing that we got anything done there, I think. But, uh, uh, so that is my, that, that would be my answer to the question, what should Urban and all of its wonderful scholars be taking from today? What are your, what is your advice? Well, again, if I'm going to put the, the sort of the content piece to the side, there was so much content, and Urban has so long been expert in sort of bubbling up the content that matters, and suggest that, and I, Sarah, you know this, forgive me, that this is fundamentally a systems redesign issue, uh, trying to create an adaptive capacity on the part of this institution that is agile enough, moves quickly enough in real time to actually be relevant to policy and practice. I think you've done that, but I think as the kind of issues we've heard today sort of accelerate and deepen and spread, uh, it's going to require, I think, a new set of capabilities on the part of the institution. And I think that raises, in turn, three, three quick challenges, if I could do another three. Um, one is the extent to which urban adaptation can embrace the kind of distributive leadership structure I talked about. That's complicated stuff, trying to figure out what the roles of 
of this institution might be in relationship to the private sector and the public sector and the philanthropic sector and what happens when you sort of recombine those and they begin ricocheting off each other. What is the data and the analytics that is truly helpful? I think second, up a level perhaps, is how urban can optimize platforms that truly connect to other um, repositories of information and analysis. Again, I think you do a very good job. I keep looking at Sarah because she's going to be furious. But I think Urban does a very good job uh, at this. But I think it demands even more. And particularly as you begin to go to ground and you think about nonprofit data intermediaries, what are, the, what are the kinds of intermediating functions that Urban might play both uh, at its national peer level through the states and down vertically to local um, units of government and then across the civic spectrum and the civic infrastructure. Uh, and then I think finally what I, what I heard a lot today was whether there is a powerful and compelling and actionable place that urban can stand in helping translate data and research and learning to the strengthening of degraded civic institutions. That's a big challenge. But those institutions are of all types and all kinds, as we've heard today, whether it's prison or housing or anything else. And I think the possibility of engaging in that deconstruction and reconstruction process is a, is a big institutional challenge. And I think it represents a, a pretty major point of departure for any institution with this kind of history. But that's, again, why I was so encouraged by Sarah's opening comments, that this really becomes both a, a pivot point, but also a reaffirmation of the underlying values that have always guided the institution. Well, that is uh, a, a terrific jumping off point for us as we begin our next 50. Um, one of the transformations that you can't see, you can see the building, but one of the transformations you can't see is that we have, we were historically uh, a, a, a almost fee-for-service business. Mm -hmm. A government uh, client would want a, a research and we would execute. A funder would want uh, a, an evaluation or a piece of research and we would do it. Mm -hmm. and, and we, want very much to be cross-cutting if you look at all the different disciplines that we have. We want to be the kind of institution that is nimble in the way you've described. And our funders have gotten that. Mm -hmm. You have gotten that. Mm -hmm. Others in this room have gotten that. That we have to have entrepreneurial money. That is the, and the, and the, and the trustees have stepped up. Every single one of them has stepped up to help the scholars who know an issue is begging to be addressed and just can go and do it and then say, here is a body of work. Here are, we have a ton of data. Here are ways that we can slice that data and make it useful to a city, to a degraded institution of some sort. So to me, the partnership that is reflected in the people who've been here today uh, has been fabulous for them, but particularly for us as we are on this journey. We will take up that challenge, Rip, because it is a big one, but it is a journey that we've been on and one that we are going to continue. So with that, I mean, 10 minutes, pretty good wrap up. <laughs> so what we have coming up, uh, for those of you who can stay for dinner, we are across the street for dinner at the Hilton. Those of you who have not uh, had the chance to check out our roof deck or our fifth floor, please, uh, uh, please have a look. Uh, and we uh, thank all of you who have participated. This has been an unbelievably meaty uh, and challenging set of, uh, of discussions. We got our money's worth out of you uh, <laughs> at our, in, our, in our various panels today. I, 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 uh, I was like in a, a kid in a candy store because I went from one to another listening to bits of very energetic conversation, the yield of which uh, for Urban will be profound. So I thank you very much and uh, uh, see as many of you as possible at dinner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great sub, man. <laughs>